Uh, we've got a very full day today, important sessions here, lots of breakout sessions, and a fabulous gala dinner this evening, so it's important for us to get started on time now. Uh, our first session is on a centrally important topic, and I'd like to invite the panelists to come on up and have a seat right now. I'll introduce them when they get up here. Oh, yeah, you. actually, you're in that one. I'm in this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, look, our topic, our topic is what's different? Uh, new growth strategies, new business models after the reset. The idea is simply this. We went into a financial crisis and, in the developed world, a recession of historic proportions just over two years ago. Uh, the recession is arguably over now, although some think that we might go back. But even if the recession is over, the world we are going into now is very different from the world we left when the crisis began a little over two years ago. Economies have been transformed. The Western economies, in particular, seem weakened and likely to stay that way for a long time. Some of the developing economies look stronger than ever. Industries have been transformed. Financial services, automotive, media, these industries have been turned upside down in the past two years. Companies, great and famous companies, have gone bankrupt. Some of them disappeared entirely. Other companies have risen up and have become newly powerful. It's a completely different world, and so our topic is how do you strategize and operate in that new world? We have a tremendous panel to talk about it. Sitting closest to me, Josef Ackerman, who is chairman of Deutsche Bank. Dominic Barton, next to him, who is global managing director of McKinsey & Company. Uh, David Brennan is CEO of AstraZeneca. And Ellen Coleman is CEO of DuPont. So I want your perspective all on this same topic. Dominic, I'll start with you, because you see all industries, as it were, at McKinsey. What's the most important difference now from the business environment we had two years ago? Uh, I think I would point out two things in particular. Uh, one is that I think that there are some longer term trends that have been accelerated. We talked a bit about that yesterday, but this rise of the emerging markets has been accelerated with the stimulus program. So we now have 900 million new middle-class consumers coming into the market over the next 10 years. I think that was very much accelerated. In China, there was huge stimulus programs in Indonesia, all over the world, Brazil, Africa. And so we're seeing that continue. The infrastructure uh, programs, $10 trillion, those have been advanced. So I think that has been a big shift. And so a, a lot of organizations are clearly looking for growth. Right. And that's where you need to go. I think the second thing I would just point to is volatility. Um, it, it's our sense that obviously volatility was very high during the crisis. Um, we think that, that we're going to see v an increased level of volatility uh, over the foreseeable future. This is not short term. So just to give again a, a, just a, a number on it, you know, the VIX is one number people talk about just to some measure. And that's typically, which is the, the S&P 500 movement in stocks. That was uh, roughly 20 before the crisis. It went up to 80 during the crisis, and it's around, I think, 35 or 40 now. And I just use it as an indicator, but it's exchange rates, commodity prices. Right. And I think that, that is a very challenging uh, environment to operate in. Right. Well, why do you think volatility has become a long-term uh, issue? I, I think because there are so many changes going on right now in the world. We've got, again, this, uh, I call it the, the re-rise of Asia, if you will. Right. You know, it's, it's, and that is a, an accelerating shift. Um, you've got a very large demographic challenge going on in the Western world with aging populations, which is going to have huge productivity issues. We've got digitization. I mean, you look at, I think we've now got 4.6 billion people with cell phones. Interestingly, in Africa, I think there were 2 million in 1998. There's 400 million now. The, the, the world is way more connected than it ever has been. So information uh, issues get shifted across the system quickly the whole repricing of the planet system. So we've got all of these things, in a sense, coming together with a more connected world. And then we've got governments which are trying to 
help, and in some cases they are, in some cases they're not, right. uh, which creates a lot of uh, issues. I mean, one other little anecdote, we've done an estimate that the, the sort of value at risk, if you will, just from regulatory shifts, and this isn't just in banking, this is in other areas, is about $3 trillion, depending on what decisions occur. And so that's, that's a lot of uncertainty right. with a bunch of forces together. Yeah, it is a bunch of forces. Joe, in your industry, financial services, this was truly revolutionary. This world was turned upside down. What's the most important change now from what it was two years ago? Well, I mean, volatility also comes from the tremendous uncertainties we are seeing in the regulatory domain right now. Right. And of course, also the fact that we have seen the unthinkable. I mean, in a very liquid environment, we have seen for the first time that liquidity is drying up, that you could not have money markets or capital markets. So I think the interesting point is, are there any business models which are superior to others? Right. And in our analysis, this is not the case. Actually, you have winners and losers in every business model. Pure investment banks, pure universal banks, hmm. pure hybrid banks, hmm. uh, you could name them. Right. The, the funny thing is what then makes a difference because right. you have 15 or 20 banks which really did badly and, and many others, uh, hundreds of banks, who did pretty well right. during the crisis. Right. And at the end, I think it's much more focusing on core competences. And core competences, I would highlight above all, the a diversified earning structure, which helps, of course, especially because of the rise of emerging economies, but also risk management. And risk right. management in a much broader sense than what we have seen. And that's the biggest change, in my view, in our industry. Right. Uh, a much more holistic approach, taking into account now a different relationship between state and market, a different relationship between emerging economies and the industrialized world, a different relationship between social trends. And that's why communicating and also being part of the social media, if you like, so has become so much more important. So really, I mean, it's a very powerful point that you can't find a superior business model when you look at what happened over the past two years. There's winners and losers in every one. So it was execution, management, and in particular, risk management. You think what that characterized the winners? Well, I would say it's quality in, in general. I mean, uh, management quality, but it's risk management in particular. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I'm a strong believer that experience played a role in this, in this context. And, and I always say good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from having made mistakes. mistakes right. So why fire everyone who makes a mistake? Give right. him another chance, but right. ask him not to repeat it. <laughs> right. And I think that is a very important message and a lesson I learned, and, and we did so, and, and I think quite successfully. It's a great point. Whenever somebody makes a mistake, you've just invested in their education. Exactly. So uh, you want if, them. If he does it only once. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, so Ellen, your company, DuPont, has gone through a fundamental change over the past decade in the first place, right? I mean, you changed, uh, you and your predecessor, Chad Holliday, changed the uh, conception of the company. But what is the most important difference in your business environment from two years ago? I think it's the acceleration of the emerging markets. I mean, the emerging markets were on a great trend before the financial crisis hit. Right. Um, but that's been absolutely took a step change. You can see it in the automotive market right. um, particularly, but it is across the board. Right. And I think it's going to continue because of the population changes and growth we're going to see. There are going to be 3 billion more people in the world 40 years from now than there are today. Right. They all need energy. They all need to eat. Right. You know, they're going to occupy the same landmass, so they need protective, it, protection issues are going to be big. Right. And these are going to mean that science is going to play a big part in that, and whether it's getting more yield out of a hectare of, of maize, whether it means lightweighting vehicles for more energy efficiency. So for us, it was really moving uh, a lot of the application development, research, marketing into the local markets right. um, at a much faster rate than we'd seen before the crisis, really getting close to the industries locally, right. understanding what their needs are, and to be able to really then deliver on the innovation and the research and development. This would seem to play to your strength since a couple of years ago you, you were, as I gather, in charge of developing the right. international, the developing world strategy for DuPont. This was even before you became CEO. Yes. So is the idea now to do these things that you were going to do, but much faster? Well, in, in essence, it, I think there's a, a shift in terms of what we felt the kind of the order of industries were before and after. Right. Automotive has moved much more quickly. So you really have to have the local presence in order to do that. When powertrain goes into a country, 
all the plastics follow it, the molders, the you know, um, compounders. And so that has taken on a much different trajectory. Um, oil and gas, uh, the protection side of that, protecting workers now is becoming is a much higher trajectory. So I think the order that we saw in 2006, 2007 has fundamentally changed. That's interesting. That's interesting. David, in pharmaceuticals, you have seen a ch huge change in your world also in a different kind of way. Uh, obviously, important new regulation in the United States with the passage of the health care reform. Austerity in Europe, I was told that Greece, just in the past few days, passed a law cutting pharmaceutical prices, 26%. I mean, this is a fundamental difference in how your industry operates. What's the most important difference for you? Well, I think the, uh, this trend of acceleration of things that were already underway is another theme. In, in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, the trend is probably the requirement of payers to more clearly demonstrate the value that products that we bring to the market really add to the healthcare system. And I, it's not just health economic or financial value, it's quality of life value, right. but the hurdle um, against which payers, insurers, governments, providers, patients when they have to pay, uh, to, pay to want to pay the premium for innovation right. is higher than it used to be. And I think, you know, the knock-on effect of that is for the first time in 2009 in the history of the pharmaceutical industry you saw a decrease in spending in research and development right. and that has to do with the fact that companies like ours and others are getting much more focused on areas of unmet medical need where we believe when we are successful in bringing a product through that we can clear that hurdle for innovation so I would differentiate dementia and Alzheimer's disease where I think the society would generally say with an incremental advance to prevent onset or reduce symptoms there is a value to be paid for versus areas like high blood pressure or you know in our case proton pump inhibitors the control of uh, acid in your stomach where drugs that have been around for 15 or 20 years are becoming available generically, right. they become much less expensive and to demonstrate what additional value you bring in those areas is much more difficult. So bottom line, I think the R&D focus of the research-based industry is more focused on things like dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, inflammation, areas where there's still unmet medical need. Yeah, Joe. I would like to, <coughs> what uh, David just said, also say something about the financial industry in the context of value. Mm -hmm. uh, it is interesting that uh, probably as a consequence of the crisis, that's probably the most fundamental one I see, is that people are trying to find values. And, and uh, that goes to financial innovations. If Paul Walker, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, normally says half chokingly, the only added value of financial innovations came from the automated teller machine it's, it's, a, it's a critical comment, and, and uh, I think it's up to us to do two things. One, to examine much more clearly and fu more fundamentally the suitability of products. So what are you going to sell? And the second one is we have to be able to demonstrate what is the value added of products to the real economy. And I think in that sense, value is a key uh, change. And, and it's not that easy actually to prove the value of products to the society at large. It's a very broad point that consumers, individual consumers, also companies, customers of every kind, are not simply more frugal, which you often hear. It's not that they're more frugal. They are redefining value mm -hmm. in this environment. So th what you've got to think up is the new way to give it to them. I wouldn't say they're frugal. I mean, they are willing to pay a price. Right. They are willing to spend, but they want to have value in exchange. And I yeah. think that's the big difference. David, you said R&D declined in 2009 for the first time. And the reason you gave wasn't directly related to a recession. No. It was related to a change in the industry. Is this a bad thing for the world in general? I mean, if the pharmaceutical industry is spending less on R&D? It is if we can't deliver with what we are spending on. So, I mean, you know, when I meet with my investors, you know, one of the main questions is their, uh, our view compared to their view of return on investment right. for research and development projects, which for us, 
you know, to bring a product through the develop, discovery and development cycle in our industry is one and a half to two billion dollars, 10 years, and that allows you to start. So right. if you're successful and the success rate is 7% right. from zero to 10 years, that gets you to the starting point where then you figure out, can you really have a create value with what you have? So uh, we aren't in a position yet where the industry is not providing research and development. Right. I think the question is, can we sustain <clears throat> the same level of uh, success and innovation that we've demonstrated in the last well, if you go back 100 years, the, the last uh, century, lifespans more than doubled be right. for a lot of reasons, right? But one of them is also medicines. Right. If that happens again in this century, people will live to be 130. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, medicines contribute right. to that. Dec right. you know, so, so is it good? I, I mean, I think what it does is it's getting us more focused. That's, yeah. You know, and we're, we're getting out of things that we don't think uh, are yeah. productive. And, and people living to 130 changes investing profiles a lot, uh, <laughs> Joe, so you have to think about that, too. I just the, say something on, on innovation, and, and Ellen will have a much deeper view, but I, I just think, too, one thing we've noticed is actually the level of expenditure in R&D has actually stayed relatively constant through the process. And I think what's interesting is you, you do see I think there are some winners and losers emerging in some markets in terms of what people are doing on that front. I think one of the things, though, we're seeing is there's a lot of innovation now occurring around the world in, in emerging markets, too. And a lot of people think that, well, that's all about low-cost, cheap stuff. It's actually innovative breakthrough uh, ideas that are coming through these other markets. And we're seeing people beginning to shift that footprint as well. Right. It's a great point, and I wanted to ask you about it, Ellen. You know, in this session yesterday, when we heard the voices, I was struck by the incredible innovations yeah. that people are coming up with uh, in markets uh, in Africa at very low cost that could be applied everywhere. Where are you going to be so, doing our You know, when we took, we took out a lot of cost in 2009, we yeah. took out a lot of cost, but what we didn't touch was our research and development program. Now, we reviewed every single program. Right made sure they were still relevant in what we thought the new economy would look like. Right. Um, but we felt very clearly that to position ourselves for growth coming out the other end, we needed new products, we needed innovation to engage our customers. Right. Price goes down, not up, without innovation. And it's the value um, that, that Joseph was talking about that we really need to engage. We introduced 50% more products in 2009 than we did in 2008. Right. And I think that really has helped position us. And it's not just about, um, at the end of the day, how do I bring lower cost? It's how do I bring higher functionality? Right. Um, and what is that function worth? Right. And that's at all levels of the pyramid, even at the low end right. uh, and, the mid and the high end. Because at the, at the end of the day, the changes that my customers are looking for is how they position themselves in their marketplace, and can our science enable that? Right. And it's a it's and it's occurring, as Dominic said, all over the world. It's just not in Wilmington, Delaware. It's in Shanghai. It's in Del Mar, South Africa. It's in. This, Marin, this would seem to be a very important point. I mean, one of the most famous case studies in business is how your company Dupont, in the Great Depression, yeah. kept R and D constant, and as a result, produced some of the all-time great products, nylon and neoprene and yep. so forth, yeah. that made billions of dollars later. The question now is, where will you be doing that R&D? More and more I hear companies doing it in China, in India, other places. So we still do basic research, um, and it's a private company that's still unusual, but we do that in one place in our experimental station in Wilmington, Delaware. We do applied research all over the world. We've opened labs in Paulinia, Brazil last year, in Hyderabad, India two years ago, Shanghai five years ago. Right. In our ag business, we have labs in South Africa, we have a lab in Kenya, research and development in order to produce the best seed, right. product seed for <coughs> the environment. So we have actually, over the last decade, globalized our applied research greatly. Right. No, I was going to, one, one of the things just I was also thinking too, <clears throat> there's the, on the research side, just coming back to one of Joe's comments on this risk and, the vol and on the volatility. I think, you know, this is an area where uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, this is important with the financial institutions. It's not just financial institutions, it's all companies. And, and, and the risks that we're seeing are so many in a way, and it's the combination of them that um, people have to look at and sort of how many torpedoes can your company take at one time right. and right 
you have a view, Joe. No, I just wanted to say two things. Um, first of all, I think uh, in the old days, before the crisis, there was a lot of focus on shareholder value. Mm -hmm. I would now call it, it's a stakeholder value. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is, I think, a major difference, that we are much more focusing on clients, on people, on, on the society at large. Right. But having said, R&D in banking is investing in people. Right. And Dominic and I were just uh, at a forum in, in Petersburg. 50% of Russian companies are complaining about shortage of skills. Right. Mm -hmm. And you hear the same in China, you hear the same in our part of the world, probably right. South Africa as well. So investing in people right. will be absolutely key and we have to attract the best. And, and that's why the war for talent is, is still on, even, even at the peak of the crisis. I yeah. certainly agree, David. Well, I just would add to Joe's point, I was gonna say that you know, there's an element internally within our organizations that all this disruption causes which is disruption within the company so the r d issues that we're talking about you go in and tell your r d organization we cut some projects we didn't now you know we still spend close to five billion dollars a year in research and development right. but the r d guys thought we were going to spend 5.5 billion right so to them it was well wait we didn't get the increment and i'm saying well look before we give you the extra 500 million tell me how we're spending the first couple of billion like what are we doing here right. and it create that's different than what we were doing just a few years ago right. and that is a direct result of some of these pressures i think and you've got as joe said you got to have people in the organization because to me the one other element i think we should at least discuss a little bit is leadership in the company right. when things get tough outside right. people look to us to say tell us what the world is that right. we're living in it you know right. when when you're laying off people and we're restructuring part of our organization i, I sit down and, you know People are looking over their shoulder, like, uh, you know, I wonder if the Grim Reaper's after me next as opposed right. to what do I need right. to do to make this advance in dementia treatment? Absolutely. Everybody's focus shifts to the wrong thing, which is, do I still have a job? What did you learn? What's the most important thing you learned about leadership during this uh, difficult period? Uh, clarity of communication and transparency. So being as clear as you can be about what you know at the time you know it right. is very important because then at least, and then people see some things happen, and, and the, the upshot of it is you get some credibility because you told them it was going to happen and it did happen. So communication, transparency, clarity, and you know, taking my top 100 leaders from across the world into a room and making sure they understand the strategy, the things that we're trying to do, and then figuring out, asking them what do we need to do from a management perspective to enable them to get this message into the organization because it doesn't come from an email. Yeah, right. The alignment right. is critical and in addition what I found is that when the global financial crisis hit and volumes were plummeting everybody turned inward. Right. They like closed their door because right. they, they were afraid yeah. of the knock or you know yeah, right. and so we needed to focus people outward again so we asked them to do four things. We asked them to cut the capital expenditures consistent with the volume outlook. Right. We asked them to cut fixed costs consistent with the level of business. We asked them to make sure they focused on the customer. Right. And even if they didn't travel as much, they had them on the phone or video conference to make sure they understood what that customer needed. Right. And most important, because of the volatility in the financial markets, generate cash. Right. And so we asked our company, you know, every person in our company to focus on those four things. And it was freeing because they really felt like if they could play a part in one of those four things, that they were going to be valuable to the enterprise, and that meant that they would you know, contribute and, and continue through. So It's an interesting point from both of you, because what you're saying is it's really important to do things that at that moment you may feel least able to do. In other words, focus more on the customer when the customer's spending less, Communicate more when you feel less certain of what you have to say. Yeah. This is a real challenge Absolutely. and doesn't come naturally to people. Yeah. Joe, does this resonate with your experience? Very much, and I fully agree with uh, what Ellen and David just said, but I would like to add another point. I think uh, the more we open up to, to broader markets, including emerging economies, the more we have to rely on local talents. Yeah. I mean, we have a few hundred people in South Africa. 99% are South Africans. Wow. And this is our culture everywhere. And I'm very happy to have Ellen here. I think we need more gender diversity. We cannot have 50% of the society not represented in the most senior management positions. And, and therefore, to rely on those who know markets better right. is a key difference and a differentiating factor. And I think those who have recognized that they're doing much better in the emerging economies than those who send expats 
to China, yeah. to India, who would need two years to get adjusted and then five years later or three years later they want to go back right, or their right. spouses want to go, their families want to go back. That's not going to work. Yeah. You have to have access to the leaderships in these different countries. Yeah. Dominic, you know, Joe mentioned uh, and all have mentioned the importance of the human capital yeah. and of course every business <laughs> represented up here is entirely dependent on superior human capital. Yeah. But McKinsey's most famous for de being dependent upon the very best human capital. How has your life changed in that respect over the past couple of years? Well, I, I couldn't agree more just on the talent and just back on the notion. I think with the world being so complex, that to think that one CEO or leader can manage all of that is just, it's, that's over. It's a, you need teams, you need people to be able to do it. No, for us, I have to tell you, we, we use this time actually as a time to recruit. Right. So we tried to go counter-cyclical, if you will, and, and recruit. And I would probably say I've spent 30% of my time on campus because we have to. I mean, the one metric that I'm keen on is what's our ranking in terms of attracting the population of people that, right. that we're after? Because if we don't have the right. talent, we're, we're finished. Right. Um, and what did you find... When you, I'm interested, when you visited all those campuses, what did you... We were just talking before about in St. Gallen. I, I did a session where I just went into a dorm with about 40 students, just had dinner and so forth, and I try and do that in, in some of the other places I go. And what, what I have noticed that seems to be a change is there's a lot of people that want to join an organization, our, or our organization, saying, what difference will I be able to make in the world? It's not... It's actually quite different than it was before. It's noticeably different, and so... What is it that we're going to be able, what experience will we give them to be able to make a difference? It wasn't around the financials of what was happening. It wasn't around uh, just the business side. It was more of a societal impact side. I've noticed that shift. It's a very good point. And I, it's consistent with what I hear also, which is yeah. people want a purpose. They want a, yeah. purpose, a noble purpose in their work which every company can offer if you are able to articulate it, I, is yeah. my suspicion. Now, actually, Joe, your industry is being pounded on right now, right? It's not very popular at the moment. What do you do when you go out and talk to people, especially prospective young people? Well, to young people, I always say, join, join an industry in a crisis because that opens a lot of career opportunities. <laughs> but, and and, and right. that's actually quite a convincing... I did it myself, so it's quite a convincing <laughs> argument. But secondly, no, I think we have to explain much more. We have to, to be in panels. Uh, we have to, to go to uh, talk shows. We have to explain. We have to... But we also have to, to say very clearly that our industry uh, messed it up and, and, and we have to, to get better. And, and uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to be defensive. But on the other hand, we also have to, uh, I think, highlight and, 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 and very much emphasize the importance of a financial industry for the real economy. You cannot have a global production capability or a global trade without having a global financial system supporting it. And in that sense, I think we have to eliminate and I talk of excesses. <laughs> uh, eliminate the excesses in our industry, and, and, and on the other hand, we have to uh, be simpler, more transparent, uh, and clearly to explain how we can add value to, to, the, to the society at large. And in that sense, uh, I think it's a challenging debate which we are having, uh, much more interactive, and young people want to have this sort of responses, in, including are you a good corporate citizen? Right. Are, you, are you doing the right things in terms of ecology? So uh, I, I like to have young people being challenging us and being more critical of some of the excesses we have seen in the industry. Yeah. Well, and you talk about, I mean, everyone here has spoken about volatility being at a sort of generally higher level uh, for a pro I mean, Maybe it's a permanent change. I mean, the reality is, although no one wants to say it now, the reality is that the financial services business offers plenty of ways to deal with volatility, including through much derided derivatives, which are in fact a terrific way to deal with volatility. Can you eventually make that case in the future? I, I would say volatility we were always managing. Yeah. What we have seen now, that we have fundamental shocks. Yeah. Look at the oil spill in the Me Gulf of Mexico. I mean, this is something which the industry was not prepared for. And, and, and there is no technological response to all of that yet. And, and, and the other thing is, of course, what we have seen in the financial market, a completely drying up of liquidity in a, in a situation where we had excess liquidity in the market because people were keeping their money 
pillow. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that is something completely new. And we have to, much more like the insurance company, uh, companies, start thinking about shocks, about radical uh, changes. And, and you know what we always would like to see a gradual adjustment. It's not happening that way. These are radical changes. And, and how to deal with that, that is the, that's why the shock absorption capabilities of companies and industries have become much more important. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask about different business models because I do get the sense that they are changing. Uh, in fact, Dominic, I have to say a number of uh, people in your business, consultants who see a lot of industries, have told me that this is a fundamental change over the last yeah. few years, that a good business model used to last for decades, yeah. right? And now it simply doesn't anymore. It may have to be changed every six or eight years, maybe even more often than that. Is that consistent with your finding? It, it is. I mean, I, I think we should also note, though, there always has been change. I mean, sure. if you look at the, you know, the, the average lifetime of a company, you know, it's, go it's gone from the 1930s from about 30, 40 years down to about 10 years. And by, by that, I mean either being merged or acquired by right. with someone else or actually going back to up. I do think the metabolic rate has gone up. Right. And just as, a, a again, an anecdote from talking with probably about 150 CEOs over the last year, I would say that half believe that their business model will fundamentally change over the next five years. And that's the footprint of how they operate, the type of talent right. uh, that they have, a whole number of things. That said, I think there's always core. We should not not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You got to stay close with your consumer, your yeah, yeah. customer. The, the, you got to treat your employees well. So I, but but technology in particular is one that that I think we haven't seen um, all of the implications of that yet, and how we organize and run ourselves. We were talking before about, you know, the the t with high definition video that's going on with and every organization was cutting travel right. well more people are now running their businesses with the videos right, right that are moving on i just think it's a small example yeah. but i think there's a lot of changes than what the mobile phone can do from enablement um, so yeah I, I would, I, and i would add to that i think probably some of this has led to more collaboration so I, i've tried to push this a bit more in our research and development organization especially uh, but but there are i think a lot more examples in our industry of areas of the company of, of expertise coming together with other companies who have the expertise and to share the risk and potentially share the reward. Right. Uh, and, I would, um, and I would contrast that to the consolidation you've seen in this industry. So, you know, Joe knows that the beginning of 2009 was the worst financial crisis. We thought we were in the Great Depression. Right. You know, we didn't know quite what was going to happen. And at that time, Pfizer bought Wyeth for $66 billion. Merck bought Shearing Plow for $40 billion. Roche closed out Genentech for $100 billion. You had $200 plus billion in our industry go into consolidation, uh, which is a, a sign of maturity in an industry. And yet, it's one where David can still slay Goliath if you come up with an innovation that can beat the big companies major product. And so I, I'm more of a collaborator. I don't think consolidation is the way to go because I don't think scale and research by in and of itself conveys an advantage or a benefit right. that you can't get if you're getting innovation in your own right. organization. Right. And this is a theme I hear over and over from every company that wants to innovate, which is pretty much every company. Collaboration and doing it in a much more sort of embracing way is the way to go. But it's a very difficult thing for most people because they don't think that way. Ellen, well, you have... You know, in the 1930s, when you mentioned that we were very prolific in terms of innovation right. and, and discovery, um, we did it all ourselves. Right. And the biggest change over the last 10 years or 15 years in our company has been the realization that if we limit ourselves to the science that we can create, we are limiting our ability to grow. And we've done more collaborations in the last three or four years than I think we may have done in the history of the entire company. Um, you know, for instance, we have a, uh, a, a way to get to a molecule called butanol. And it is a, it's an ethanol equivalent, except it has higher energy content. It doesn't have all the issues, doesn't absorb water. Great stuff. We can make the molecule. We can't get it to market. We partnered with BP. Right. You know, and so we do more and more of those types of things, to, especially in new innovations, new things that there's a lot of risk around. Right that you really need to find who has the expertise in each area, and if you can pull that together, then you can get it to market a lot more quickly, 
Right. So your return on the innovation is higher the sooner yeah. you can get it to market. So we're finding that being a more important model yeah. in with the great uncertainty there is, volatility there is today, than maybe it was a couple of decades well, ago. What's the greatest challenge in getting people inside DuPont to ch switch their mindset to thinking like that? I think it's around um, the return on innovation that, that David talked about being uh, a metric. You know, it, it, when you're a science company and you've been around 208 years, so we're outliving the 10 year thing by yeah. a little bit, yeah. um, people are heavily into their models and what made us successful in the past. And so it really has taken a new generation of scientists, a new generation of PhDs that come in, that come, you know, mid-career hires from other companies or from universities to really mix it up. They're no longer lifers at DuPont. Right. We're picking up talent all around the world and in different places. And it's in that integration is freeing. Right. Yeah. Um, and it really is because what you find is that the people, you know, working with someone who has a very different set of experiences than you raises your intellectual quotient, emotional quotient around how you need to do business. Right. And so it really is actually an accelerator. Dominic. No, I was just going to say too, what, one thing I've noticed from our work is the number of clients that actually want people with cross-sector views. So, you know, if we're do, working in healthcare, they'd like people from the telecom industry to work. Or <laughs> if uh, even in, in pharmaceuticals asking for, we'd like some media people. I remember one, I said, well, why do you want, me, are you, is it a communications program? They said, no, we're, we're operating on a treadmill that's going very quickly, but those media guys are, are in an industry that's changing so quickly. We just like to inject a bit of that in to see what it's like. So I think this notion of, the, of collisions, if you will, coming together where you get innovation yeah. and the collaboration that's required and getting sort of, I would argue, hybrid vigor into the place is, is um, more important because, the, again, the metabolic rate has gone up. Yeah. You need ideas. And I would yeah. just add to that, to, to Ellen's point, is that my observation of uh, how we've done this is that there's a finite capacity within the organization to have these collaborations because, by definition, they take more time, they take more energy, uh, they take more governance. They, and so you've got to be selective about where you do it. It's not something I think that um, you know, will infinitely multiply itself. You've got to say, in cardiovasculars, in metabolic disorders, is there somebody who matches up with us that we think we can work with for our five or 10 year life cycle period right. and collaborate within the marketplace? Uh, uh, so, we're, you know, you, it, uh, you just have to pick your spots, is my right. point. Right. Is there an implication in, I mean, here we're talking about volatility, collaborating in ways that we never used to do before, bringing outside points of view. Is there an implication for people's careers that is going to look very different from what it used to? I mean, every company represented here is a great, big, successful, global, long-established company. You have all worked in those companies for your, almost your entire careers. You, you were at GE Ellen first, but you've still been at DuPont for 20 years or more. Yeah. Um, is that the career path that your best young people today are going to have? Joe? Yeah, I, I, well, not necessarily. I, I think to have worked in other industries might be quite, quite uh, yeah. productive. So I, I wouldn't say someone has to stay 50 years in the same company. Yeah. Uh, but what I think is more important is that you have spent a lot of time in your career in foreign markets. Yeah. And, and I mean, just uh, making uh, Dominic's point, I mean, Deutsche Bank, we were 15 years ago and that's also a little bit shows that certain megatrends have started much earlier. Uh, we had 80% of our business in Germany. Now it's 20%. Wow. We had 10% uh, uh, investment banking, and now it's 80%. So in, in that sense, there are tremendous fundamental shifts in companies in the last 15 years. What is new, in my view, or might be new, the first is the question of size. Is there an optimum size? Because some of very large companies have failed in the crisis. And uh, is there an optimum? Should we rethink the, the, the notion of size? Secondly, what is going to happen in terms of the value chain, which uh, Ellen and, and David talked about it? Are we breaking that up? Do we have to allocate uh, certain resources to other value chains in order to be more productive? And thirdly, and we have not talked about that, we talked about emerging markets as a potential. But these are also competitors. Right. If you look at what is happening now in, in terms of market cap, the largest 
banks right now in terms of market cap are Chinese banks. Right. And, and China has $2.6 trillion of currency reserves to invest if they want to. And, and will that change? And they have invested in, in a bank in, in South Africa. So is that a new phenomenon that th this kind of uh, uh, national banks, national oil companies will have a much bigger role to play in the markets uh, in addition to the international oil companies, for instance? I think this is going to happen. And how can we join forces or, or do we have to be competitors? Or can we do things together? Because the numbers of funds to be invested are so big in terms of R&D that I don't think any company can afford to do that on a standalone basis. And I think you have to work together. And I think that's a completely new phenomenon, which is actually a very attractive part also for young people, because you are suddenly being part of a global network. Right. And, and what can be more attractive and more, more uh, challenging than that. Right. That, actually, that gets to a point that I want to ask each of you about, a larger point, which is whenever something large happens, like the financial crisis and the recession, I mean, as awful as it was, it was a big phenomenon, and a big phenomenon also always holds opportunities. Yeah. I'll start with you, Ellen, but I want to ask each of you, what was the opportunity that emerged from all of this? I think for us it was um, fundamentally the ability to quickly restructure and realign a company um, around the megatrends occurring in the world where our science can deliver benefit. So creating a large, strong production agriculture unit, creating a strong unit around electronic materials for solar, for, you know, it uh, displays electronics. And so we took the opportunity to take out a layer of leadership, simplify the company, focus them outward on the markets, and especially in the emerging regions. We reorganized each one of the businesses with great clarity around the mission of that business, the purpose, and what success meant for them. And what success meant for them it was competitively based in the marketplace and put in the right metric. So it allowed us to get great clarity to David's point and simplicity around what winning meant for that business, and we were able to do it very quickly yep. because see, the crisis because just allows people to line up uh, very, very quickly when you're... Right. They winning. always say when you want to create change, you've got to create the burning platform. Right. Well, and the platform was, was actually on fire this time. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. David, what was the opportunity? Uh, uh, I, agree with, I agree with Ellen. I think, I think it was around clarity. I mean, uh, you know, uh, we had macroeconomic change. I told you, you've got massive merger activity going on with your major competitors. Uh, it causes you to stand back and say, I haven't, you know, I've said that's not what I think we need to do. I need to suspend my judgment about our strategy, go through the entire process again, right. and land on an answer that I believe I can live with and when we did that and we decided we have a go-it-alone strategy with collaboration as, a, as an element of it, it brought a lot of clarity to the organization. Pe you know, because people are always asking, you know, well, I see because of that merger, they're now into healthcare and consumer products. You know, those guys are now into generics. You know, and I've said, look, I see all that. You know, we're going to win or lose based on the innovation in our research laboratories. So if you're involved in that, you're going to help us win or lose, and there will be winners and there will be losers. Right. So bringing that clarity, I think, was very, very important. Yeah, Dominic, similar message? Yeah, I would say that the crisis, in a way, um, allowed us to, if you will, challenge our orthodoxies, because we actually don't like taking our own medicine that we, and so that was quite an experience to go right. through it, and we had to. We had to do, we had to look at everything, our costs, why, why do we do things in the way we do it? So it, that crisis allowed or enabled everyone to kind of step back and challenge orthodoxies. It also, we also sort of said, let's have the view of, while well, others zig, let's zag. Yeah. So people are going this way, let's move the other. So we, it allowed us to open up six new practices. We were focusing on, you know, look, let's double down in these growth markets ahead. And I think the other thing I would just say is, I think one of the benefits in a sense of being a private company with ourselves as our shareholders, our, our sort of mission is to make it better for the next generation so we can be long-term. And, and that gives us flexibility, right. I think, to then try and, and change. But right. right, makes sense. What was the opportunity for you, John? I would say two things. One is, uh, it is clearly that before the crisis, we all have become a little bit complacent and we build up and, and probably were a little bit fed uh, when the crisis started. And the refocus on efficiency again has been made much easier during the crisis. And I think that was a key message internally. Second is, 
uh, stay the course in a crisis. And uh, I was very adamant not to take any taxpayers' money, and that gave us tremendous opportunities right. because people felt they stay the course, they can yeah. afford to stay the course. We, we uh, stayed the course with clients. Uh, we didn't uh, reduce our, our loan portfolio and many other things. And I think to have had this sort of a platform intact coming out of the crisis has opened tremendous opportunity in terms of markets, but also in terms of products and above all in terms of people who want to yeah. join a, a platform which right. is intact and which has all the ammunition to grow. Yep. We have very little time, but I want to ask each of you one final thing because, okay, we've talked about the changes from the crisis and recession that we went through. What is your main message to your people in your company now? What's the main thing you're telling people in your company now? Joe first. Well, well the key message is clearly um, we have stayed the course and, and now uh, get out and, and get business. And, and, and uh, so very much uh, looking forward to pushy yeah. approach. To We're through the bad period. Now let's go win. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Dom. It's very similar. It's stay the course, stay, so cl stay with your clients. All that's the most important thing through thick or thin, whether we're doing work or not, stay with them through it. And that's, that should be our focus. Right. Don't, right. Yeah. David. I think the, uh, the uh, maybe two. One is, um, the, you know, the idea of collaboration is important. C creativity and innovation are going to drive the success of our business. And we need to understand how to make those things happen in a way that we have not done as well as we should have in the last five or seven years. So, and people need to understand we haven't done as well. If you take a look at us, the scorecard is that you, we've got to step up our game, and, and I think that's important. But the other one is that value question. I think, you know, our investors and our payers and the insurers, everybody asks us how we add value. And so the other question I say to everybody is you've got to ask when you're doing something, how does it add value? And I think if people have the mindset similar to what Ellen said about how you give people four things, at least they feel they've got something. You know, say to somebody, why are we doing this? Tell me how it adds value. I want to add a person. How, you know, it's going to cost us a hundred grand. How, you know, right. how are they going to create 150? Right. Ellen, big it's message a, to your people. It's about market-driven innovation. It's around um, really understanding that marketplace in a way that allows us to resource our research and development and application development to bring value to the customer. So we, I just use three words, market-driven innovation. It's great. It, you know, because here we've talked about the increases in risk, the accelerations in uh, the acceleration of trends, the rise in volatility, which are all extremely important. At the same time, the message that a lot of you are emphasizing is one of constancy in the things that don't change and the things that we'd better not forget as we go through all of this. Uh, we've got to wrap up, I'm afraid, but I want to say to Joe, Dominic, David, Ellen, Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.